Welcome to Ebenezer United Methodist Church. We're so happy to see all of you here on this beautiful day. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you for revealing yourself inside of us, Lord. Thank you for revealing yourself around us. Thank you for revealing your truth to us. That we're blessed and the reason why we're blessed. Lord, thank you for the reasons that we're all here today. There are no coincidences. We are here for a reason, Lord, and thank you so much for investing in us so that we can invest in you. In the holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Scripture reading this morning, if you'd like to join me, is found in Psalms 98, a song of joy and victory. Sing to the Lord a new song, for He has done marvelous things. His right hand and His only holy arm have worked salvation for Him. The Lord has made His salvation known and revealed His righteousness to the nations. He has remembered His love and His faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout out joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst in a jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with harp or guitar. With the harp and the sound of singing. With trumpets and with the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together with joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people with equity. Thank you, Lord. Please rise and join us for our hymn of praise, page 400, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing.
Christ's love.
to page 881 for our affirmation of faith. The Apostles' Creed. This is what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and stood at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Altar flowers are in loving memory of Margaret, Mary's sister. Passed away at the age of 40 on Mother's Day. Their mother passed away at age 27 when Mary and Margaret were only six years old and both were adopted. As young mothers, they spent many mornings together in Mary's kitchen enjoying coffee together. Margaret was a caring Christian woman and Mary misses her greatly. Let me mourn with you. Flowers are beautiful. Thank you. This Saturday comes our annual spring barbecue. Yay! 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 yay. <laughs> I think um, 6 a.m. Friday morning, the wife will be barbecuing, cooking, roasting, causing traffic hazards with all the smoke around here, <laughs> but also putting a little seed of <coughs> delicious food in people's minds as they drive by. Um, and then Saturday morning we'll be. Um, we have a sign-up sheet in the bulletin board. Please come and sign up where you can help us. And uh, we have lots of other announcements in the bulletin. Uh, on May 14th, another trip downtown to um, feed the homeless. Steve, is there anything you want to add to that, Steve? Yeah, just the fact that um, if you ever walk around in wet socks before, you really use socks. It's a dollar story. Socks and shirts. All right. Without that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it. Oh, one more. Sorry. Sorry. Thing. Uh, yes, sir. A week from Monday, the general conference of the United Methodist Church starts in short. We just need to be really, really in prayer for our church. Amen. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Save me.
uh, thank everybody who was part of the work day yesterday. We just had it was a great turnout, long day of work, got so much done. Uh, we're just very blessed by the volunteers, the faithful volunteers here. And uh, be sure we have our news, the new newsletter is out, and on the cover of that, uh, Stephanie has explained what, about the uh, encouragement project for the ministry she's working on. There's all sorts of other items in there, information about the church we'd like you to, uh, to know about. And please do sign up for the barbecue. That's such a huge event for us and the community. It's been going on for a long time, and so uh, it helps for Jill and for Eric and for Dwight to know who they can on. And, and Ralph, I think, has been uh, as elected as the outside coordinator, um, <laughs> the non-food division. But uh, it's, it's really uh, a wonderful topic in church. So please do sign up for that. And I just thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness and, and what's, what's been going on here. We've been so blessed. And as we enter this time of prayer, I want to remind everyone of the first commitment we make as a church when we join with the body is to support the church by our prayers. And so anybody who would like to, uh, in that effort, join us every Monday morning at 9 a.m. We begin our week with prayer right here. I sort of encourage you to be a part of that, and if you can't make it, then you have some specific prayer concerns you don't want to raise out loud, write it on a piece of paper, put it in the offering plate, and we will be faithful. There's yeah. a lot of things we need to pray for. probably saw in the, in the news about the young girls from UGA who died in that uh, horrific crash a couple days ago. Three of those girls are graduated together at Milton High. Uh, one, of the, one of the young ladies had been a member up in Birmingham and her service tomorrow. And her mom is somebody that has served with us in the Emmaus community before. And she just did a remarkable job in, in explaining on television her faith. And, and I just cannot imagine what it would be like losing young ladies that age. And so we want to keep them in our prayers. We just have a, a number of ongoing concerns. If you look at your bowling in and just pray over all those names and families that are there, we have a host of new concerns as well. Tracy, as well as asking, we pray for her father, Brian Witt, and he's awaiting double hip surgery. We want to pray for a, a complete recovery from that. And, and Carlin, he has continued to recover from a uh, soldier, uh, so, <laughs> shoulder replacement surgery. Pray for her and uh, shoulder. And what other, what other prayer concerns do we want to raise up for Thanksgiving?
gather here in the peace and serenity of the sanctuary to hear from you. Lord, allow us that ears to hear your still, small voice. Lord, we just give you thanks for the miracles that we've seen here, for the transformed lives, for the healing, for the those facing emotional turmoil and struggles, Lord, that you have comforted. Lord, we so much desire and seek more. We want to intercede on behalf of our loved ones, among our family members and friends and neighbors and co-workers, and even those people in the community we do not know that our hearts break with them over their loss. We pray, Lord, for your presence to be known, and that you would just pour out your Holy Spirit in this place, fill this place with the presence of your Holy Spirit, and give us sensitive hearts, Lord, to know what it is you would have us do, that we would that we would be fulfilling your ministry. And so, Lord, we want to pray for the global United Methodist Church, for the local churches. We pray for all the other denominations that surround us, that they would have godly leadership. And, Lord, just in all the things that we do, anything we do in our own ability, from our own desire, from our own agenda, may it fail utterly and completely with a giant crash, that we may solely walk in dependence upon you. Lord, we just thank you for the faithful servants that have come before us and allow us to be proper and good stewards of what you have given us. So, Lord, for these things, we also give you thanks. We just, we just come in with such a gratitude for this day that we would remain like-minded, a body of believers gathered together, praying.
day 30, you know, as we move into adulthood, it's difficult for us to forge those friendships that we made as children. And part of that reason is we're lucky to get in time with each other, to be able to go out and have a cup of coffee with somebody or we even share a meal. It'd be a struggle just getting together. And so very often, you know, we don't have the time invested to develop relationships like we'd like to because as adults, we don't do many sleepovers. When I was a child, I spent more time with my friends, more time in their house than, you know, very often I did with anybody else. And so you, you have those, those friendships you form, that bond. Well, I've had the blessing of working on Emmaus weekends. It's a long sleepover. And so we've had the opportunity. I've served with Reverend Danzy, and, and we not only sit and chat throughout the day, but, you know, into the evening we're sitting there talking. And believe it or not, I actually, I listen a good bit, don't I? <laughs> my 
Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let a rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burden.
nothing else could take Feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way, bring me back to you.
be mentored by him or to spend time with him. He's an older prophet, and he um, there's a lot of a story there, but I want to just pick up on one little scene that happens toward the end of his life. And I want you to just remember we're at our best when we're reaching forward and when we're reaching back. And it's found in 2 Kings chapter 2 and uh, verse 5. Excuse me, verse 9. So, so the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha... Now which one's the younger one? Elisha. Yeah. You've heard the sermon before. <laughs> had stopped at the Jordan, and Elijah took his cloak, his mantle, he rolled it up and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I am taken from you. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it'll be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along, talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. And Elisha then picked up Elijah's coat, or cloak, that had fallen from him, and he went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Now he'd gone to one side of it, but Elijah took his cloak and separated the water, and now it's his turn. It's his chance to be given authority. It's his chance to be given leadership, and he's going to see if it works. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. I should stop there and make you read it when you go home, but I'm going to go ahead. (laughs) Where now is the Lord God of Elijah? He asked. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. There's a beautiful picture of mentoring, of discipling, we would call it, or being an apprentice of someone that we see in the life of Elijah and Elisha. And Elijah must have known that the end was coming for him. Uh, So therefore we know he was somewhere over 40. Uh, <laughs> see a lot of people that I, I do a lot of counseling personally uh, in my ministry I uh, counsel men specifically I counsel marriages and, and, and things like that and a lot of people struggle when they hit midlife and they think midlife's 50 and I always tell them man if you're 50 you're way past midlife <laughs> <laughs> you've been on the decline for a long time <laughs> yeah, CDC said in 2012 that the average lifespan of a woman in the United States is 81.2 years. That would make midlife 40.6. For a man, uh, average span of life is 76.4 years, which would make your midlife at 38.2. So every year you live after 40, man, that's just a cupcake. I mean, you're <laughs> yeah. You can call 50 midlife, but you know, <laughs> you're a little too optimistic. <laughs> And so you can fake it, you can color it, you can paint it, you can nip it, you can tuck it, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> but if you're after 40, you're past midlife. And uh, so we know that Elijah must have sensed that, and so he took on this project, we'll say, of mentoring, of investing his life into a younger person. He had a lot to do. He was a prophet of God. Elijah was the most, most famous prophet of God. He had plenty to do. He had taken on 400 prophets from another religion at one point. I mean, this guy was not sitting around twiddling his thumbs going, gee, I'm bored. I'd like to mentor someone. I'd like to disciple someone. No, he had plenty to do, but he knew this was God's will for his life because he was in his best with reaching forward and reaching back. And the one thing that I fear so much about my generation and the generation that's a little older than me is that we become so self-centered and so worried about our own comfort and pleasure and purpose that we forget that there's a generation behind us that we're responsible for. If we don't become intentional to teach them of how to walk with God, who is? Amen. And so the Lord sent me here this morning to tell you that. Last Monday I was standing in Red Square, Moscow, and I was talking, I was over there teaching at the seminary and at their conference. The Central Russian Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church was smaller than this room. This 
congregation I'm looking at this morning is larger than the central dis- central conference of Russia. Russia has 11 time zones. You get in Moscow and you fly west nine and a half hours, you're in New York City. You get in Moscow and fly east nine and a half hours, you're still in Russia. Mm-hmm. We have pastors that have ridden eight, uh, 18 hours by train to just be there. They're hungry for the Word. They're hungry for leadership. They're hungry for mentoring. They're hungry for Jesus. They're there. I, we stood in, in, in Red Square talking to these pastors and and realizing that these people love their families, they love their spouse, and they love the Lord, and they're trying to, to live. But there's no, there's no generations before them. Every single person we met from the bishop down was first generation Christian. They were raised by atheists. And they met Jesus and fell in love with him, and they committed their life to him, and now they're looking to the older generation to the mentor and disciple. There isn't one. There isn't one. They're all first generation. And so, instead of sitting around complaining about it, we're trying to teach them and train them on how to be that generation that reaches back. And Elijah knew this, and so he reached back to Elijah and did all that he could. He poured everything he knew about living for God into his life. And we see here that it was enough. So many of us say, well, what would I do if, 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 if I'm over 40, if I'm kind of on that end of, of life, what would I teach? What would I share? You find somebody that's younger than you in the faith, and you teach them everything you know about how to live for God. That's, it. that's called discipleship. That's all you got to do. Teach them how to pray. Teach them how to study. Teach them how to share their faith. Teach them how to witness. Teach them, teach them how you live for God on a daily basis by investing in their life. That's what Elijah did with Elisha. You see, this mentoring concept is not new. We've been a part of it for a long time. We just may have not seen it from a spiritual lens. Listen to some of these famous mentors mentor relationship. Did you know uh, there was a man named Andrew Carnegie who mentored a young Charles Schwab. Peter Drucker mentored Jim Collins who wrote Good to Great, one of the great business books of our era. Colonel Sanders, you've heard of him? You'll probably eat some of his chicken here in a moment. He mentored a young man named Dave Thomas, founder of Wendy's. Mahatma Gandhi mentored Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. mentored a man named John Lewis. He had a naval vessel named after him. Elijah mentored Elisha. Moses mentored Joshua. Jesus mentored John. And of course, the most famous of all mentoring relationships was Luke Skywalker, mentored by Obi Wan. (laughs) 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 And so, what we realize is this. Is that if you're still breathing, then there's still purpose for your life. Amen. If you're not taking a celestial dirt nap somewhere, God has got a plan for you. God has got a purpose for you. And it's not to consume it all on yourself. It's to take what you know about living for God and pour it into people who are interested in knowing that. And the question then becomes, well, who would that be? Well, look around you. I said, look around you. <laughs> I mean, it figures. You didn't have to. <laughs> Think about those at work. Think about those in your neighborhood. Think about those at your church. Who is it, God, that you put around me that I'm not perfect? I, I mess up so much, but I'm one step ahead of them. I could reach back. I'm reaching forward, but I can reach back to them and bring them along. That's what Elijah did. Elisha's what Jesus did with the disciples, and it's what we're called to do as well. I've never met somebody that's doing that that's spiritually dissatisfied, but I've met a whole lot of church people who are kind of bored with their faith. And I meet people who kind of are bored with their faith. I ask them, who are you discipling? Well, nobody. Well, that's why you're bored. You start leading somebody else, man, there ain't time for boredom. You start sharing your faith with others. You start investing your life in them spiritually and walking with them over a period of time to bring them to spiritual maturity. Guess what happens? You become more spiritually mature as well. It's called disciple making. It's what Jesus calls it. It's what the mission of this church is. When the church, the global church, uh, gathers in Portland, then it'll be the mission of, that, of, of the global church. But it's not just the mission of the global church and the church. It's the mission of our individual lives, too. To be a disciple, to make disciples. We see it in the life of Elijah and Elijah. But the question is, who do we look for? Well, I want you to write this on your uh, little notes there. I want you to write the word faith right down the left side. F-A-I-T-H. Faith. These are the qualities and characteristics that you're going to look for in the life of someone that you can invest in. And then I'm going to give you another faith acronym for the 
characteristics and qualities that you need to possess to be that spiritual mentor. So these are what the first one is what we're going to be looking for in someone. And the F stands for faithful. Well, Mark, well, this sounds great. Um, and I don't know exactly what I would do or who I would do this with, but if well, this is what you do. You start praying and you look for people with these qualities. The first one is faithful. People who are faithful to church, faithful to work, faithful to their families. I'm not talking about people who are living on the, the margin of life, who are who, who maybe angry at God. I'm not. It's very difficult to mentor them. You can care for them, pastor them, counsel them, but I'm talking about people that are going to be like Elisha was looking to Elijah saying, teach me. You're going to be looking for people that are faithful in some capacities of their life. They're going to be looking for people that are available. That's the A. In other words, they're not so overcommitted to their hobbies and to their careers that they don't have time for God. You find somebody like that, you might as well, you might as well dust the, the, your feet off and move along because if you don't have time for God, there aren't going to be time for you to disciple. So you look for people who are faithful. You look for people who are available. They can meet with you once a week or once every two weeks or once a month. You look for people that are um, intentional. You know, they're not just haphazard through life and everything's just a wreck and a mess. You look for people who have shown some signs of intentionality. Think of Elisha coming to Elijah and saying, you know, mentor me, disciple me. You look for people that are teachable. Teachable is a wonderful quality to have. Uh, if you find somebody that's a know-it-all, you're probably not going to be able to disciple. <laughs> you know, ask you a, a question and then they give you five minutes of their own answer. And then not, not teachable. It's a great quality to have. I look for that in other people when I am praying, God, who do you want me to disciple? Who do you want me to mentor? Who do you want me to apprentice? And then the last one is hungry. They're showing signs of hungry. I, I want to know more. These men that went on this retreat, there were some hungry guys on that weekend in Tacoma. I remember that. The, the meals and the times between the sessions and questions there. I can tell there was just a hunger there. You look for somebody that's faithful, available, intentional, teachable, and hungry, and it's going to be obvious that God has put you in their life to mentor them. And you pray that way. Pray, God, give me someone like that. Put someone in my life. Now watch out because it will happen. It will happen. And then you will then be walking in the fullness of what Elijah was walking with Elisha when you begin to say, well, what would I do with them? Well, you say, let's meet, for, let's meet once a week. Well, what would we do? Talk about life. Talk about scripture. <laughs> pray together. Get to know them. Teach them all that you know about what it means to walk with God. That's simple. Yeah, and what, you, what will you be doing? You'll be making disciples. Exactly. Now you need somebody ahead of you. Nathan and I, uh, you all know Nathan, he and I have breakfast about every Thursday. And we talk about this kind of stuff, don't we, Nathan? About discipleship. I say, well, who would disciple me? Mm -hmm. He would. You'd be glad to, wouldn't you? Every Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so we're at our best when we're reaching forward, holding on to someone who's just a bit more spiritual mature than we are. And when we're reaching back, bringing someone along with us, that's when we're at our best. Listen, we got one chance to run this race. Don't drop the baton. A favorite Ben Hogan quote of a golfer, so indulge me for a second. A favorite Ben Hogan quote is this. He said, as you stroll down the fairway of life, stop and smell the roses, for you only get to play one round. How will you play this one round? How will it be said of your spiritual legacy? You know, when it comes to our finances, we have no problem with this. We understand that we need to acquire things in our life. We need to enjoy them. We need to invest them. And then we need to make sure we have a will so that the people we love will get it. If not, the state decides what happens with your stuff. We're smarter than that, aren't we? That's why we write it down. That's why we're intentional about it. But when it comes to spiritual things, we just throw it up and go, boy, I hope it works. Come on. You're not going to do that with your stuff. So why don't you have a spiritual will, a spiritual legacy? This is who I'm going to invest in for the time I have. I don't know how much time it is. And this is what I'm going to teach them how to live for God. And I'm going to take this thing seriously. And, and, and I'm not going to just cross my fingers and hope that my life is so good that people will just see me and see Jesus and they'll go to heaven. No! You don't live that way. We live with intentionality. Jesus was so laser-focused intentional. The disciples were too, and so are we. That's our calling. To invest our life into the lives of others. We are best when we're reaching forward, reaching back. God has given you a spiritual baton to pass. It doesn't matter how well you run this race. If that baton hits the track, you lose. 
We must finish well. We must pass on our spiritual legacy. So these are the qualities that we need to be possessing. Not only what we're looking for in, in the next generation or those behind us, is faithful, available, intentional, teachable, and hungry, but we need to possess these qualities, and the first one is fruitful. As spiritual leaders, as spiritual legacy makers, as disciples of Jesus, we need to be having lives that are fruitful. Jesus said, you know, you, if you pray in my name, you can ask anything you want, and it will be given to you. Don't stop there. <coughs> we love to stop right there, don't we? <laughs> he said, if you pray anything in my name, you can ask whatever it will, and it will be given to you. Boy, that sounds great if you stop there. He said, it's my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. That's what we're talking about. And so be, being fruitful in our lives. Uh, I look around, I know some of you in this congregation, you're very fruitful when it comes spiritually with your lives. Next thing is accountable. That you would take very seriously the call and mission that God has placed on your life, and that you would be accountable uh, to someone a spiritual mentor, a spiritual leader, a pastor, like the one that's leaving now to go get a snow cone. You told me, I'm looking at where you at the sermon here. About 10 after, we're going to get a snow cone. But accountable. That we don't just wish our spiritual lives to reproduce, but we have a plan. And we meet with people who can teach us how to do this. We're fruitful. We're kind of, that we're investing. That we have this concept that we would invest our life in others, not just make deposits. Now, many of you understand the difference in a financial deposit and an investment, right? We get the difference in those things. Anybody in here ever made a deposit? No, just me and just, just us two. <laughs> Anybody here ever made a uh, financial deposit in anything? Yeah. Easy, quick, no growth. Safe. Sure. <laughs> but what about an investment? It's long term, risky, intentional, strategic, high reward. Now think about the difference in spiritual deposits versus investments in someone's life. Spiritual deposits, I'll pray for you. Hey, I haven't seen you in a while, I'll call you. Let's go on a mission trip together. Let's go to May. Spiritual deposit. What's a spiritual investment? Where you would say with someone, I'm willing to carve out in my time an hour a week for the next year for you and I to meet together and me to teach you everything I know about what it means to live for God in obedience. That's an investment. High yield. High fruit. Risky. Not easy. Investments aren't, but we need to be those types of people who look say, God, I can make spiritual deposits in this world, but who are the three or four people that I'm going to invest in? The T is transparent. That we would be open and honest with our life, with other people. If, if, if you're going to walk through this world as a Christian and try to fake everybody out and you got it all together, that's not going to do much. you got to be honest with people. Man, I don't have it all together. Jesus has it all together. That's why I'm following him. Sometimes the way gets tough and it gets foggy. You know, it takes being vulnerable with people. The people that I'm discipling, they, I, I'm trying to be transparent and vulnerable with them about things that I, issues and hurts and fears that I have. And here's the thing about vulnerability, Dr. Brene Brown says, that whenever we see someone else being vulnerable, we always see it as courageous. Isn't that interesting? For instance, if I'm on the platform and I'm being vulnerable with my life, you always look at that and go, well, I took courage to say that. But when we're the ones being vulnerable, we always see it as weakness. Let's say right now I just share a, 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 a deep, dark episode of my life and I just become vulnerable with you. You go, wow, it took courage. And in my mind, I'm thinking, uh-oh, they're judging me now. I shouldn't have shared that. It's a crazy thing about vulnerability. But we must be vulnerable. Jesus was vulnerable. You can't be more vulnerable than naked on the cross in front of your mother. Vulnerable, but he did that for you. He did that for me. Let me give you some examples of in our book Darren Greatly, Brene Brown asked the question, vulnerability is, and had people write in what vulnerability is. The world needs more people that are open and honest like this. She took a collection of what vulnerability is from different people that wrote in. This is 
what they said. Vulnerability is sharing an unpopular opinion. Vulnerability is standing up for myself. Vulnerability is asking for help. Vulnerability is saying no. Vulnerability is starting my own business. Helping my 34 year old wife with stage 4 breast cancer make decisions about her will. These were actual people that wrote in to answer this question. Vulnerability is hearing how much my son wants to make first chair in the orchestra and encouraging him while I know it probably won't happen. Vulnerability is calling a friend whose child just passed away. Vulnerability is signing up my mom for hospice care. Vulnerability is the first date after my divorce saying I love you first and not knowing if I'm going to get love back. Vulnerability is showing people a piece of art that I made. Vulnerability is taking a promotion and not knowing if I'm going to succeed. Vulnerability is getting pregnant after three miscarriages. Vulnerability is exercising in public, especially when I don't know what I'm doing and I'm terribly out of shape. Vulnerability is stepping up to the plate after a series of strikes. Vulnerability is admitting that I'm afraid. Vulnerability is having faith. Vulnerability is being accountable. Do any of these sound like weakness? <coughs> no. Because when we're vulnerable, especially before living and loving God, it's always seen as courageous. And there are people in this world that desperately need to know how you live for God. They need that kind of courage. And finally, the last quality that you and I need to possess as disciples, as mentors, as leaders, is humbleness. Humility. It's a quality that Jesus had, and he said this. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am humble in heart. And gentle, you will find rest for your soul. One of the greatest characteristics and qualities of the greatest leader that ever lived, Jesus, was humbleness. Do you struggle with humbleness? If you're a proud person, you do. But we know this. We either choose humility or choose humiliation. It's our choice. Last week I was standing in Red Square and I was reminded of how this humble leader, Jesus Christ, that we worship and that we follow is absolutely unstoppable. Standing there with a pastor and the president of the seminary, and we're literally standing in Red Square. And to my right is the Kremlin. It's a very large place if you've ever been there. It's huge. There are stands being set up for a military parade. And I can remember visions of the only thing I knew about Red Square before I went there was watching the military come through there with those nuclear weapons on those trailers and standing there just thinking evil, evil, evil. Well, today, like it was last weekend, if you're standing there in Red Square on your right, what you'll see is the grandstand set up for the military parade in two weeks. Lennon's tomb, where all the military officials will be. Behind them is the Kremlin. And across Red Square, there's a building, built in 1890. And on that building, there's an icon or an image of a face. And it's the face of Jesus. Florida. I stood there looking at that going, are you kidding me? In two weeks, when Putin is standing there on Lenin's tomb watching the military come by, there's going to be one face on Red Square staring back at him as the face of Christ. This guy is unstoppable. This guy is unstoppable. This is the man that we serve. This is the man that we love. This is the man that we worship. This is the man that we try to emulate. And what did he do? He came to this world and he told us about his relationship with the Father. And he taught us how the Father was like. And he taught us how to live for the Father. And then he passed that on to, guess who? To <coughs> you and me. Folks, we need to leave a spiritual legacy. There's a generation coming behind us that need us desperately. No matter what age you are, there are people that are less spiritually mature than you and they need 
you. It doesn't matter how well you run. If you drop this baton, leave a spiritual legacy. Father, I give you praise for this morning and how this morning has actually turned into this afternoon. And Lord, for this spirit-filled church that you died for, that you rose again for, that you have empowered by your Holy Spirit to make a difference in this world. God, I speak a spirit of encouragement over each and every person here that we have gifts and graces to offer and that we would not be crippled by our failures and by our, our weaknesses and our fears, but we would realize that with you all things are possible and you live in us. Oh God, that we would take very seriously this charge to make disciples to reach back to the next generation. Not to be so consumed with our own problems and our own issues in this world, but that you would use us, God, to make this a better place, to, to redeem the world back to yourself. Lord, I just pray a spirit of revival over this church. God, that this would be the talk of the town, that you would begin to, to move and do things here that are beyond our belief and that it would start in the hearts of every person right now in the sound of our voice. I ask your blessings on this church and upon the land and leadership. And God, if there's someone here today that does not know you, does not have a relationship with you before this day is over, that they would drop to their knees, surrender their heart and their life to you and experience life like you've never known. We give you praise for all things strong and able in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The most important thing is it passed along to us began 2,000 years ago. And that is the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. So that's something that we have been given that we have been blessed with and that we get to celebrate. It's the greatest honor that we have as a, as a gathering that we can share in this meal together and on that night that Jesus gave his life up for us. He was meeting with the disciples and he took the bread and he broke the bread gave it to them and he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper was ended, he took the cup Again, giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink. This is my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, as we remember the mighty act you've done in Christ Jesus, we ask that you would bless these elements of bread and juice and make them become for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by His blood. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Craig, I'd like to take a couple of you, please. something a little differently in uh, we're actually going to have two stations this time and one of them will not feature a guitar <laughs> <laughs> so we'll move this and I'll remind you that any offering that is left any money left at the altar rail goes to Beat the Drum Village which is the orphanage that we support in Kenya and I remind you too that the United Methodist Church, that this table is open to all because this table does not belong to the United Methodist Church, Church, nor does it belong to Ebenezer. This is the table of Jesus Christ. And all are invited who receive Him as Lord and Savior. The table has been prepared. Come as you are this side. The come and I will serve you. And, and you'll take it by intention. You'll give you a piece of bread and you'll dip it in the cup if you want to spend time at the rail. 
And if you're on that side, we'll go over there, Reverend Nancy and James. And put your hands in the sign of the cross as you come forward. Come now, we see
what do I need to know more than anything? And what I heard over and over again was, get them out by noon. <laughs> But you know, I'm an editor and I always say that, that it's really easy. I can make them short all day. When it, somebody says their story was too long, I said, it'll cut like butter. The last words I gave the Reverend Danji, I said, do not trim out one word. <laughs> and I normally say that our service is 90 minutes long. We get out early every week. We may not be out early this week. But when you think about a group of folks traveling more than a day to be fed and nurtured, I wish we could stay here longer. So if never received the benediction, go forth from here with hearts full of assurance that a God of miracles, a creator God, is still alive and well and desires that we would pass along his message of hope and love and forgiveness. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.